Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Welcome everyone to the GP Strategies webinar, Empowering the Field Force. Uh, and Laurie, I think, yeah, we can take it over from here. Yes, well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for uh, registering and coming on board today. Um, we want to stick it to the hour and we want to make this as Im impactful as possible. And to be impactful, um, we'd like you to be involved as well. So please use the chat, ask as many questions. We've got a poll question coming up. We've got a chat question coming up uh, and we've got a team of panelists that we've been working with over the last month uh, to, to provide you with some feedback and some insight into empowering the field force. So a little bit of housekeeping to start. Um, what we have here is uh, just an image of the, of the chat side. Uh, on the chat, you'll see there's two parts to it. One is a chat function, and I'm sure you're all aware of the chat functions. If you're not aware of WebEx, it's on the right-hand side. Um, and you can chat to everyone, or you can chat directly to individuals if you wish, if you're in a team. And there's also a polling function. So we'll put up a poll straight away just to get you familiar with how it works. Both the, the, the poll function will have operating for a while, so you can answer when you like, and then the chat function, there'll be a question coming up uh, where you can answer that as we're talking through the panel discussion. And then during the panel discussion, you may have some questions that Zach will prompt me uh, during or after the panel discussion that, that the team can answer. So please make this as impactful and interactive as possible, uh, and we'd like your engagement through this process. So Zach's going to put up the poll first up, and this is just to get familiar. Um, it's not a tough question, but it may be a tough question because we all may be going through some of these changes. So the poll question is, is your organization currently going through a structural change? So you just need to answer yes, no, maybe. Uh, you may be unsure. Um, that will stay up for about five minutes, uh, but the key to that is uh, getting you familiar with it, and just our understanding is if you're going through organizational changes, this all relates to not only field force, but your organization in general. Zach, you can't see my poll thing, can you? Um, I, there is the poll option open on the right. Yeah, okay. So if I close that, that's fine. It should be fine. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So going straight into... Okay, so I'm Laurie Martin. I'm the APAC Business Development Director for, G for GP Strategies. Um, I've been, I'm based in Bangkok in Thailand, um, but I'm currently in Australia. So I'm back home seeing the family after a long stint of COVID. Um, obviously that's affected being able to visit people and it's no different in business, hard to visit people over these past few years. So there's been a lot of changes. We've also got Zach who you can see um, who is our uh, APAC marketing manager, who is the guru for marketing for us throughout the region uh, and has, has been kind enough to put this together for us. And most importantly, we've got the, the panel members. We've got, um, uh, and I'll introduce individually, we've got Scott McCormack, um, who I've worked with in the last 10 years all over the world. Um, Scott is from New Zealand, I'm from Australia, so we are rugby tragics and uh, we will always uh, challenge each other. Um, Scott is ahead of the game there with the, the All Blacks, but I reckon we're going to come back. Um, but what's job, job, what Scott's known for is getting the job done, and that's our job in the whole of the Asia Pacific to support all of the markets on how we can improve their workforce. Scotty? Thanks, Laurie. I love, love your optimism. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm based here in Bangkok, responsible for GP's operations in, in Thailand, India, and Philippines. Uh, my, my background is, is in the automotive industry. That's uh, in my 30-year career. The first 20 years were spent uh, working for, for OEMs and distributors. Um, my field force experience, I've been a, an area manager or a zone manager myself uh, back in, uh, uh, in my early days in New Zealand, uh, calling on and supporting uh, dealers across the country. And then later on in, uh, during my career uh, in India, where I was responsible for the entire marketing and sales and service operations, we had a sub fairly substantial field organization of probably 50 or 60 people uh, spread across 
five regional offices uh, throughout India. So that's the that's the experience I'm bringing. And then since then, obviously with GP Strategies, you know, we get a good look at lots of different automotive clients and how they organize their field force and how that field force can impact on uh, on the success of their their retail network. So really good to be here today, Laurie. Thanks. Scott. And uh, we've got a, a great guest, Kunsananta uh, or Kunjib, uh, based in Bangkok, um, who's the head of corporate banking for the Bank of America uh, and is in the Thailand branch, but also on the board of directors for Merrill Lynch Securities in Thailand. Um, what's important about this, uh, this webinar is that we bring different industries into it so we can get an understanding of what other industries are doing. And I'd like to welcome Kunjib uh, to this panel and uh, give a bit more information about her background. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, so um, I'm glad I have got a chance to be here today to discuss with um, many audience. Um, so, so a little bit of my background, I have about 20 years experience working with um, the banking field. So it, it's slightly different from um, where, um, the, the, uh, the audience um, um, uh, area. But, but my area is more on the people management as well. It's not only um, the people in the organization, but also the clients that I need to deal with. Um, so a little bit on my background, I'm working with the Bank of America now is um, a year number eight. It's, it's quite long. Before um, today, I'm, I'm working with uh, Standard Charter Bank as the individual contributor who, who run the sales team as well. Um, before that, um, Citibank um, in another seven, seven years. So most of my time starts from the individual contributor until today I'm leading the team of about um, five person. So I, I do hope um, I could share my experience to the, to the audience here. Um, and if and I speak too fast, or you may not um, understand what I'm trying to say in terms of the, the technical term, please feel free to stop me or, or raise your hands, um, ask, um, um, I mean, um, text us or, or anything, willing to, to share as much as I can. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kunjib. And we also have Stephen, Stephen Crook, who's based in Australia, in Melbourne. Stephen is actually retired, but uh, when I asked him what does he do, um, he mentioned that he's an investor, but I think he's more so a man of leisure. Um, Stephen worked 35 years with Ford. And what was interesting about Stephen is that he's had 24 different job roles within Ford over that 35 years. So it, he would he would be a, a master of many, but he's focused on the uh, on the areas of field force and management right through from the ground level to executive leadership. So Stephen, a bit more about you. Thanks, Laurie. Yeah, it's uh, it was a, a certainly a one employer um, over all of that period of time, but a really diverse range of jobs, um, but not the least of which um, covered sales, marketing. I had a, an opportunity to be involved in product development, which really taught me about an emphasis on the customer as we particularly look at product development, uh, anticipating customers' needs. I then um, did a stint in motorsport for um, effectively my first turn at sponsorship management. And then from an FCSD point of view, Ford Customer Service Division, that was, um, that was my last role as VP. But sitting on the board of Ford for uh, probably about 17 years, it gave me great exposure to, um, to all aspects of, of the company. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure I'm the best investor, but I'm not sure I'm a man of uh, of leisure um, either. I think of all of my roles, probably the the key for me is I, I've I've been a field manager in both small country towns, um, metro, rural, um, to the largest of the metro zones for Ford in Australia, a regional manager, a national sales manager, and ultimately um, a, a general manager or vice president of FCSD, which all had field. And my great passion linking through all of those jobs is the connection with the dealers and our ability to motivate and um, you know make some positive contributions to them. So hopefully I can contribute something for your panel. Thanks very much, Stephen. So we'll go straight into it. And the first area I just wanted to focus on was just a snippet in relation to GP strategies. Um, we do a lot of research around leadership 
uh, and HR and how to transform uh, transform workforces. Um, this was a study that we did, uh, a recent study in Q2, same time this year, last year, of around 550 business leaders and HR leaders. Now, business leaders and HR leaders like Steve and, other, and uh, Clint Jib are the ones that put strategy in place to support the workforces to support their partners. So this has a direct correlation with, with field forces, uh, whether they're sales, after sales, uh, what, whatever part of the business it is. But from these 550 business leaders uh, last year that were surveyed in North America, in EMEA and in Asia Pacific, 20% of 10 different industries, um, we were able to get a further understanding of uh, what the future looks like in conjunction with uh, one of our membership organization partners, Future Workplace. So what this has done is provided us with a window into the waves of change impacting the workforce. And remember, this was during the COVID period. So there's been significant changes that have happened from previous to now. So, so the, the headline from this, from this study in this report came about um, of what the workforce transformation imperative is, right? And the imperative is that the accelerated pace of change presents companies with ever-shifting business demands and challenges. And remember that poll question I asked you before, that poll question mentioned, are you going through some structural changes? Right, so workforce transformation now is crucial uh, uh, as companies try to attract and keep talent and build performance cultures. We're hearing that you know the the skills drain. We're hearing that the the great um, resignation. So all of these things are impacting on us now and present, and will continue in the future. So while we're thinking of these fixed mindsets, and even during COVID, there was a fixed mindset that things would come back to normal soon. Right now, all of a sudden, they're not and we have to go into a growth mindset. And by going to a growth mindset, all the way from leadership down to the field force, we have to change the way we do things to maintain the business. So there were, there were three trends that were identified out of this study. One is that learning is moving beyond traditional organizational boundaries, right? Organizations will not be going back to business as usual as to how and where they deliver learning in their workforce. And almost 50% uh, have, have use different technologies to conduct their business. And it's the same in the field force. How does the field force learn how to implement new projects? How does the field force uh, manage uh, the, the dealers in relation to what they're learning in a different way? Is it being effective, right? Um, what, is the new, what is the new look of the way in which they're going to learn in the future and bring that growth mindset to the dealers? The second trend is workers demand a consumer grade seamless and dynamic tech user experience. So beforehand, you could go out and visit a dealer and you'd have a face to face discussion with them. Now there is some kind of tech being used, whether it's MS Teams or WebEx, whether it's uh, uh, using um, Tableau or um, uh, business, uh, business intelligence, um, there is some kind of data being used and that's a whole new world. But what everybody's looking for is a personalized experience. What is going to make it easier on them? Just like when they go into Spotify or they go into Netflix, they want that easy experience instead of something that's cumbersome, that's hard to use. So what it's saying is in, in the, to 2025, there is going to be rapid change from now to 25. And then the third trend is um, business leaders are looking to lean on, uh, on learning to deliver business transformation. So it's an intrinsic part in the future of what, where how field forces operate. Uh, you know, we're doing a project at the moment with, with a client where we're using um, uh, HoloLens glasses to diagnose faults uh, with their networks through technical. And that's changed from going out and visiting the dealer and identify, identifying the faults. But the key areas that half of the business leaders identified was business acumen, data analytics, um, changing the mindset, um, you, being able to be uh, averse with technology and then the internal marketing, the influencing of influencing other people to change their mindset. So that leads us into empowering the field force. There's change going on. And from this change, we need to understand how to, how to address this and how to approach it. And we've got the panel on to provide some information on best practices and also to engage with you on some best practices that you may be doing. So this chat question will stay up, right? So 
um, for our for our um, uh, for our guests who we're really thankful for joining. We've identified many of you come from the field force area. So in recent times, what did you do differently in your field work to meet your objectives? Right. Um, this question will stay up, and you can put it in the chat. And when the team of panel talk about it, you can actually add and contribute to it because this is all about a learning experience for everybody today. So Zach will put the chat question up. Zach, you're right with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so yeah. to, to start this panel discussion, we'll just give you some insight on what we know. GP Strategies talks to our customers and clients all the time, and we understand the challenges, right? So what we do know is that OEM invests a lot of time and money to service and prove their networks, right? The list of demands on the front line can be disproportionate to the long-term growth of the network. If the network doubles, do they double the field force? And if they don't, how does that impact on the workforce? Some demands are often beyond the skills and knowledge of the frontline worker. If new programs come up, are they well equipped to deliver those programs? Um, being time poor impacts on the ability of the frontline worker to be trained and upskilled. Do they have the time to be trained? Um, the frontline worker is, is often challenged by networks resistance to comply or change, and yet they're not equipped as change agents. You know, you'll get some resistance. So you'll get those who are on the bus. How do you actually uh, uh, penetrate a whole network to be um, working towards that change? And then the role tends to become more about firefighting customer service complaints rather than dealing with improvement, right? But where we come from, what we know is there are ways to improve workflow, the workplace and the worker. So now this leads us into the panel discussion. We've got a series of questions that I'd like to host for Scott, Kunjib uh, and Stephen. And I'd like to start with, with um, Scott uh, first up because we're hearing what the customers are saying. And Scott, the first question I'd like to pose to you is, you know, what challenges are you hearing that, that our clients are being faced with day to day? So I think that the, the challenges uh always come back to, to two things, I, I believe. One is that, you know, and, and this was really no different to when I was running a, a, a field force to today, that the first thing is how do, how do we make our field force, how do, how, how do we help them to achieve the results that we need, the business results? How do we make sure we're hitting our you know, sales objectives, customer sat objectives, your know, excellence objectives around our, our retail network? So the challenge is there is really the way that the the OEM OEM is organised, uh, and the way that they they set priorities and um, give the the field force the tools they need to actually go out and achieve those results. So that's a very very near term thing. Hmm. The, la the the second challenge and the more aspirational challenge is how do we uh, how do we have the field force be uh, you really add value to the to the dealers that they're visiting. How do we get them to uh, be able to have a conversation with the investor and the and the dealer at almost a, a peer level, right? That maybe they'll never quite be peers, but in in a in a in a way that the the dealer looks at that uh, that area manager, zone manager, and says, "Here's someone that can add value to my business." So those are those are the the, the two challenges, and it. That some of it comes around. It can you can affect very short term, uh, just the the way the way uh, you handle governance, the way you handle the internal process and organisation within a you know, a sales organisation or an after sales organisation. The second one is a is a longer term goal about how how you you develop people and and how you give them the the skills and the capability to uh, to interact with the dealers. Okay, so so um, so there's a lot about designing and shaping the field force to make sure that it that the field force is answering the call of the voice of the dealer. True. Okay, um, Stephen, um, uh, you know our previous discussions in relation to some, you know, you, you've been with that 35 years and you've seen it all. Um, could you give a bit of insight and you know? Step us through some of the challenges that you faced, how you overcame them, some of your successes, some of your failures. We'd love to hear a bit of a story about that. Cool. Lots of, a couple of successes, probably more failures, but you learn from those as well. So maybe if, if you look back over my time, 
I think the nature of a field force has changed enormously because the, the way in which dealers are structured now is totally different. When I joined the organisation of Ford in the mid 80s, um, you had a lot of um, uh, individual private owners, mums and dads, if you will, have running Ford dealerships and our field force at that point, uh, I think 87 was my first time out, you were out there meeting individuals. That is still exists today, but the multi-franchise nature and the corporations that have grown inside our industry, taking over multiple dealerships, now mean I think you've got um, a, a, a different layer of challenge. You've talked about the operational stuff, and I think individual field um, uh, people in the field can handle the operational, the day-to-day. -day. But if you want to affect real change, then you need not to talk to the manager who's running a store and that is now probably more than 50% of the stores that I'm familiar with. But you've also got to have a strategy that's business to business for the owner, because the owner may not be as part of that store. And I think you've now got, you've got two challenges to manage two different relationships to affect two different sorts of change. To, to try and manage that, um, probably one of the things that we we certainly wanted to make sure that we had, we weren't asking the wrong questions of the wrong people. And if we we're looking for capital investment, we weren't asking the field force to engage with managers so because it's clearly a waste of time. Uh, they need to be bought in, but you need to have a, a different strategy to engage with the, with the owners of businesses. In terms of the field experience for me, one of the things that that we experimented with that I think had a positive, a really positive effect for both our dealers and for the company was not looking at our field force as individuals, but creating teams when we would be able to work for maybe nearly three or four weeks on understanding and helping a dealer. And we, we developed a, um, a technique to understand which were the best performing and probably the, the most challenged dealer performances. We concentrated our efforts on the individual challenged dealers and we did it across all aspects of the business to try and provide the, the dealer principal, the owner and the managers as a, as a um, almost like a little mini board meeting, our insights, our very best to help them understand what our issue was as a company, what we saw the opportunities. And we also wanted to use uh, use it to highlight how they were managing their business. And once you've got multi-franchise, you really need to make sure as an individual franchise that your business, represented by that same owner, same manager, is being looked at as an individual business, not just part of a collective. And we found the teamwork was not only really beneficial for our learning, but the concentration of effort and resources, the concentration of uh, an all day meeting highlighted, I think, in many instances um, where we either needed to look at our relationship and say, should we continue with the relationship? Uh, if we're going to continue with the relationship, um, how do we do better? What does the company need to do to support that dealer more? And what can the company and what can the dealer do as well? So I'll stop there. But I think that was a, a really that was one of our great successes to support dealers. So, so Stephen, I, I just like to drill on one part. So you mentioned uh, teamwork. So so one of the challenges we've identified in field force is, is the wide ranging of skills needed, especially with these new programs coming about. So is it that the teamwork benefited because the team could work together on where one would be would have a shortfall in knowledge, the other one could pick that up? Is that how that would work? I think, it, it, yes, that's that's true. So our team would consist of um, the regional manager, and, and that was one of the initiatives we had as a regional manager that I carried through to the national sales role. Um, we had the business manager, we had the sales, we had service, we had the technical people um, involved. So anyone that really went to that dealership, the parts people, if they happen to be part of our parts distribution. So instead of just looking at the one element of the business, what we wanted to try and do is, is understand that business more deeply 
and across a broader range of the issues that that business had to manage. Now, interestingly enough, we found that our most challenged dealers across our criteria um, were, were never brilliant at sales and terrible at service. We found that universally they were challenged and it didn't matter where we looked, we were finding opportunities to uh, assist those dealers. Because the team was working together over a month to prepare for these uh, meetings and they were face-to-face -face meetings with the dealer, the, the team learned from each other. We brought in expertise when we needed it, but we were doing that as a group and we were all learning. The effectiveness is maybe the other thing we learned is that as an individual, you can only achieve so much, but when you create a forum, when you create a, a purposeful meeting, and we had a strategy around how we would meet in the morning, how we would enter the dealership, how the meeting would conclude and how we would all leave together. So it was orchestrated, but when we created that uh, momentum, it seemed to have far greater effect and far greater impact on the dealer and we're able to affect a much larger change much faster. Okay, well, well, on the human element side, um, Kunjib, understanding it's a different industry that you work in, we would assume that you, you have multiple branches and you have large field forces and account managers. Um, could you just give a bit of insight on, you know, you're dealing with the human element, the, the personal part of uh, field force management. Could you just give some insight into, um, how you would manage those teams. Um, I know it's not automotive, but there is some human elements that are very similar to the needs of both the dealers and your clients. Thank you very much, um, Raleigh. So, so um, I think today um, the field force that I manage is, is quite challenged because of this pandemic and worse in economic sentimental. Um, it has significant effect to, to our field force. Um, particularly on the interaction and mood of the customers, the main challenge that um, came from this were maintaining the relationship with our customer while we are trying to grow up the business uh, with the prospect as well. So um, the most challenge that I've seen, especially for the few force, um, is that um, we are not sitting together. Um, um, so so sometimes. We, it's it's quite challenge to to um, see mood and tone um, what's going on um, face to face because we can we can find it out from from the face to face meeting um, especially uh, when we when we meet client or even the team um, in person. So what we try to do is we try to leverage the technology to maintain the connectivity and keep the field force motivated. That would be the key. I, I really want to 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 say here. Um, um, I, I don't. I, I can't say that you know um, the pandemic today has less in, has less impact now because it's already carried over more than two years. Uh, the challenge that I've seen so far, especially with with my 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 field force, is that. Um, we still need to learn how to leverage a technology um, at the most effective net way. So, so that, that, that would be my, my um, observation here. And, and Kunjib, in the, the, the meaning of technology, what, what do you mean by technology? What, what technologies are you using uh, in, in what areas and, and where do you see the benefits? Okay, so so today, um, client will not really accept the face-to-face -face meeting, even though a few of them um, are willing to do so. But the technology that I'm I'm talking about today is more on the platform that we use today, Zoom, so WebEx, um, Microsoft Team, or whatever. Um, that's I think before pandemic, um, we we use it, but not as often as the way we use today, right? Everybody has a platform today. Most of the platform that I mentioned today, uh, you have it in the mobile. Um, so how you use it effectively is the key. Um, and many of the meetings, and what I'm trying to do here is, I'm trying to open the camera as as many time I can. The reason is because if the audience, um, you know, you you can't force them to open the camera, but I really want to show myself. The reason is because it's it's touching, right? Uh, with the technology, if you really want the audience to feel how you um, how you interact, the only way you can show is your face. 
your eye contact, your voice tone, whatever, right? So um, even though the opposite side client or internal um, audience may not want to open the camera, but I myself will ensure that I I am open it most of the time if the 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 situation allows. But not like you know only the the if if the if the arranger set up only a call, then I will not force, of course. But but if the platform is allowed to do so, then I will definitely do or open the camera, to um, so the audience can see my interaction. Okay, and 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 that's a really good point. Um, I'd like to bring this back to Scott. Scott, um, you know, we've been involved with this, in this for a long time, and and previously, um, that you know, face to face was always the norm, and changing from face to face into virtual or whatever it may be, there were always some challenges because before COVID, that wasn't the most effective way. But now it's the most effective way for a number of reasons. One is measurement, one is uh, analytics. So, so Scott, can you talk a bit about that, what we've learned over the, over the time that's enabling those field forces to improve? Yeah, sure. So there's a real, um, I see a real gap between uh, OEMs who have really embraced technology and those those who have not. Um, we, we've seen we've seen an ability. Yeah, we, I think we've learned that you can do a lot more virtually than you ever thought you could do. Um, it's true that there is in a lot of cases there's there's no uh, substitute for being face to face, uh, but you can do so much more. So the idea that I I had to wait until that once a month that I would visit a dealer to really know what's going on. That's no longer true. You can, uh, you can replace a lot of that visit through, um, through being very clever with the, with the standard tools like, like WebEx, um, through, through how you're collecting data through systems, uh, and, uh, and, and you can replicate a lot of that and you can do it much more frequently. That's the benefit. Whereas I might visit a dealer once a month, I can be weekly, you know, communicating, engaging, um, and that having that uh, higher frequency, uh, there's a value to that, just as there there is a value to being you know, in the dealership face to face. So we we've seen programs of of you know, implementing new processes, new you know, new products into dealers where yeah, you know, it's been done. Yeah, it, it had to be done a hundred percent virtually, right? Never once set foot in a dealership and get fantastic results because you design the program right and you make and you can get really rich data back out of that system that you're implementing to to tell you how well it's doing or it's not doing. Um, I just broaden it, it out here. I think this is one of the areas. Yeah, if if someone's looking at how do I better support my field team, one of the simple things to look at is what tools have you given them. Um, you know, I, you, you can't go to a restaurant today where they, where they don't take the order on a, on a, on a phone or a tablet. Um, you know, for years you go to the supermarket and the people that, you know, the, the field reps who are checking their products on the shelves are all doing it with a tablet. Um, you know, the, the guy that comes to, to sell me a, you know, a, a mutual fund for my, my Thailand tax, tax benefit does it all on, on an iPad. And yet I, you know, I sit in on, you know, engagements or training we're doing with different OEMs and I see, you know, field managers uh, come into those sessions and they, they pull out a big old heavy laptop. They're looking for a battery, you know, you know, for a power supply. They're looking for a Wi-Fi uh, connection. Yeah, and I just think this is an OEM that's not taking their field force seriously. Um, you know, the tools and, and, and people sitting down plugging numbers into Excel spreadsheets at the end of the day after they visit, finish their visit, um, just really antiquated. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many so off the shelf solutions these days that are not expensive that you can really have be giving the field team the tools they need to both walk through their visit, collect the data, and spend a lot less time being inefficient, you know, plugging numbers into into uh, spreadsheets for reports. So um, that that's an area I would start. If I, if I was looking at, you know, w what's an easy win here from uh, to to help improve the effectiveness of my field team, start by looking at the technology. Very 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 good point, um, Scott. So in relation to 
technology. It's, we're not talking about just uh, WebEx and Teams, right? There's other kinds of technologies to support. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's any there, there's 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 any number of really good tools out there that uh, will uh, support. Uh, yeah, that are built specifically to support a field team. Um, if you're if you're sitting within the if you don't want to do that and you're sitting within you know the, the either the Microsoft or the Google work, uh, workplace environment, um, yeah, there's there's simple tools you can build there. Uh, it's really very 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 accessible. This is not a you know, a million dollar IT acquisition question. This is really simple um, pay per user type stuff. Um, most of it already, you know, set up for compliance w within various IT environments. Um, so yeah, that's that's just a great place to start. If 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 you've got zone managers who are emailing in uh, or uploading, you know, Excel spreadsheets or or uh, visit reports in Word, that should be a big, uh, yeah, a big green light goes on. That there, there's an immediate opportunity here to do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great conversation. So, so Zach, could you? Is it possible if you could just mention from that poll just the results of that of structural change? Sure. Okay. So, so we've got sixty-two percent um, that are going through organisational change. Only about eight percent that are no, and we've got you know fifteen percent maybe. Not sure. It may be coming. Right. So it's overwhelming that there is change. And one of the challenges with change is that um, ha has the organization got the skill sets to cope with that change, right? So I'd like to bring this back to Stephen. And you know, the skill sets is one of the most important part of, in any automotive job. If you're from after sales, are they after sales experience? If you're from sales, are they sales experience? But now, if there's change going on in all the organizations, how do we know that we can secure those skill sets for this very important um, frontline job to to work with the dealers. So, so Stephen, have you got some input onto this one? Yeah, I think that we've tried a couple of different things at Ford over my time as well, and we tried really senior people in the in the organisation. Uh, when I first started in the eighties, uh, I was quite junior in the company, and the structure we we ran to was uh, new to the company. Go out and see the smallest dealers, and the dealers will train you. You came back in, did a few more jobs out to some larger dealers, uh, came back into the company, did some more jobs, get some more experience, and then go back out and deal with Metro. Um, I, I think the field force is now such an integral part of getting communications both ways, learning what's working in the marketplace and what's not, but also carrying a load of helping a dealer implement those programs. You haven't got 10 years to get the person up to speed. Um, we found that conferences, and we did them both virtually and in face-to-face, um, uh, -face, we found conferences were a really great way to get everybody on the same page. But what I really want to share is after we'd done probably six or seven conferences, we started to move our field force from participating in the audience and learning as the dealers did in some occasions to setting challenges for some of our field force to actually become presenters. What we found is that there's a very different level of commitment that's required to come along to a conference when you're the person leading the discussion and the depth of knowledge that was gained. So in some sense, maybe my point here is if you really want to value your field force, then they need training and they need opportunities to learn and to grow. And I think we tend to think of them as doing a certain job and not being involved in the future planning. We tend to keep them in the present, go and execute this. And my view is if you give them the opportunity to work on future products, you get their day-to-day -day knowledge, you can um, leverage their dealer contacts. And if you put them in a conference scenario and actually say, can you now go and present this on behalf of the company, uh, to all of the dealers, not just your own dealers, to the, the national um, conference of doesn't matter what it is, um, then suddenly you get to see that some will swim and swim really well. Others will struggle a little bit, need some more help, but we didn't have anyone that failed in that pursuit. Okay. So, so great confidence building. 
uh, great confidence building and, and deepening of the knowledge. And I think it was also important to for the, the field force that they ran in their zone to see them in that kind of national position. And I, I think it, it grew not only the individual's confidence, but I think it grew the confidence of the dealers that they had a great zone manager that was capable of standing up in front of 350 people and talk about a particular topic for, you know, 30 or 40 minutes. Yeah, f fantastic. So, so um, Kunjib, I'll, I'll bring that, 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 that was a form of indirect training um, that has empowered the actual um, field force. I know, you know, in, in the banking industry, training is so important, especially with all of the regulatory requirements. So what importance do you place on training for your field forces? Okay, so so uh, um, by making it part of practice or habits um, is the key. For example, Bank of America, we have an annual mandatory training that every teammate had to complete. Um, this helped to ensure that the field force is aware, um, aware of the key regulation as well as the updates one. So they know what to do uh, when dealing with the customer. It is also a part of our value to um, sustainably grow our business. Um, but uh, the most important here is that um, when we really want to allow them to train some something else on to sharpen their, their preference, I mean, their, their career or whatever, then we, we also have the training at the global and regional level in which we could enroll. Um, like, for example, manager excellence, um, sales skill, um, so far, so on. So that would be uh, the global arrangement that we have internally also. Uh, but what I'm, I have seen here, especially on the training, is that in the past we can just enroll the training that we, we want and we group together in one go, right? And we are not distracted from the from the day-to-day -day work. Today, we may have training during an office out, and that I I can I, I found that it's not really work well in this organization. Uh, what I can share here is that if we really need to set up the training as a manager or the key leader in an organization, you probably think about the training outside of working hour, um, so the people around may not distract from the from the training. That that what I have seen so far. Okay, that that, that that's a very good point, and. Um... Uh, so, with regard to the training itself, um, something that to bring back the automotive industry, it might be soft skills training as well, um, because you're dealing with the human element. So, more times in the field force, you're dealing with a lot of technical, um, uh, technical and program management kind of uh, topics. But I would, from hearing from you, there's also the soft skills element that that helps build their confidence and capabilities too. Yeah, all, all this training help us to, to retain talent uh, by improving their skill um, in the field, right? So yeah. um, as well as allow them to develop skill that they, they prefer. That would be the key. So the different field, different preference. So um, this training will, will, will um, um, depend. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So, look, I'm going to open the floor up for questions. Um, I don't see the chat, so I'll try and bring it up. But um, before we go into questions from, from everybody, and we encourage you to ask these questions. We've got the experts on the table, and there's some experts in the, in the guest group as well. Um, but um, just in, in uh, do you have any closing con, con, uh, comments, Kunjib? Do, do you have any closing comments before we go into questions? Kunjib. Sorry, uh, I, I need to familiar the, the, the function here, but uh, I'm on the bow mill. So um, the closing comment here, um, I, I think nothing much from my side, but um, um, we need to adapt to survive. That would be the key um, in my view. Yeah, very, very, very good. Um, every that's... industry is, is ever changing, right? So yeah, um, every industry is ever changing. <laughs> yeah, that would be like the that. either oh. automotive or banking. So um, you you already mentioned this at the beginning of the conversation in the presentation. So 
um, seamless dynamic technology experience um, is the key also. So um, big mindsets may not work in this environment. Growth mindset would be the key. Fantastic. Uh, Stephen? Um, probably the, the thing that we haven't touched on, and I think it's more important now than it ever has been because we're now uh, using a lot of technology, the making sure that we've got really clear priorities and not 120 most important things to do this month. Uh, I think when you're using technology, it, it's got a certain amount of time you can allocate before you need to stop and have a break. So I think I've seen us struggle as as, uh, as a company in not setting you know too many tasks that are almost impossible to achieve. And, and I think the other thing is to really look at empowerment, um, the ability, um, and through Ford, we put in, uh, for the regional managers, we put in a budget to try and ensure that some of the things that could be really hurtful to dealers could, that could distract them from, from the task that we have um, mm -hmm. was dealt with efficiently. And, and maybe my only insight is I always worried that if our field force wasn't selling and wasn't supporting the dealers, then no one was in our organisation. And yet mm. we seem to be really happy to distract them with everything. And I think whoever's in those national roles or who's in those sales roles needs to be involved in that, that process around what am I asking these wonderful people to do? What am, am I giving them the empowerment have I have, have I given them, and we actually gave them the budget to resolve issues, and and are we giving them therefore the tools to be able to keep your dealer on track and motivated and positive, and to grow the stature of the field force in front of the dealer. Great, and that was about a field force of about a hundred, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Scott, in in closing, before we go to questions. Sure. I mean, I, I second uh, Stephen's comments on uh, prioritization empowerment. They're, they're two of my, my pet topics and uh, absolutely critical in this context. Uh, the, the, the main thing I would, uh, the main point I would leave everybody with is if you move into a new role, you know, managing a, a field team or you want, you want to take a fresh look at your, at your current field force, Really, and you've heard lots of different ideas here, and some of them you, you'll probably find attractive and think could really work for you. But I would, I'd start with understanding the context of what you're dealing with. That the, the your field force and your retail network. There's a history there, there's a culture there, and there's there's expectations that are built out of this. So you've got to take all that into account when you think about what you want to change and how you want to change it and how quickly you want to change it. Right, so I yeah if if I and and when I say culture, it's it's your your organization culture and even yeah, even the culture you operate within 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 your country. So you know, Hofstede is your know, power distance dynamic is very real. So if I if I took over you know, a mature field team in a uh, you know in a in a you know a country a Western country a country with a Western mindset. I might expect that that area manager can can operate as almost like an equal to the to the store manager. Um, if I'm doing that with a very very young team uh, in in maybe in maybe country like like India or Thailand, it it might take me much much longer to get to a point where I can elevate that person where they can operate uh, and, and interact as as almost an equal with the with the store manager. So. Um, Understanding that context is really important, and because you can, you can go and start to affect change for the right reason, but you could maybe create a whole lot of conflict um, in getting yourself there. So, really understanding that history, especially if you're moving into somewhere new, that you know the history that comes through, understanding the business and just the oral history of talking to dealers that have been around a long time, uh, you know, uh, people in the the organisation that have been around a long time. Uh, to, to, and that'll give you some of the sensitivities of how you want to navigate forward and, and how you want to set your, your course for change. That'd be my closing comments, Laurie. Great, Scott. So um, I'm watching time. We'll go straight into some questions and I'll try and bring up the chat. Um, uh, 
So, Laurie, would you like me to read read this for you? I, I yes, please. Yeah, okay. So, in in uh, in the in the recent uh, so the, in comments to uh, the question of what have you done differently in your field work, and so one comment here is is to be more customer centric. Um, so, yeah, I'm guessing that's around really thinking um, about. Uh, yeah, yeah. From the, the end user perspective, which, which which Stephen touched on earlier, and then from 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 Ralph, who asked that question, a second question: uh, uh, What do you think about XR technologies? Uh, yeah, so the yeah, um, mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, when it comes to qualification, e.g., onboarding new staff. So, a couple of broad, really broad questions there. Hmm. So, so, so I, I can help contribute to that. Scotty and I work together. That, that you know, the, the, what do you think about XR technology? It is being used. I mentioned it before that we're doing it for you know certain um, parts of the technical side of uh, a client's business. Um, but certainly, um, it, it, it's it, different technologies work in different ways, and it's about finding the solution that works the purpose. So it could be XR technology. It could be mobile app technology. Um, uh, and the app technology might be measuring um, learning proficiency and the ability for an individual uh, uh, how long it takes them to retain that knowledge. So there's there's many different ways in which you can use it for onboarding or qualifications, but the key is to study and research the technologies to see what fits. There's that many of them out, out mm. there. Um, they're all these shiny new toys, but part of what we have to do is do the due diligence to make sure that they stand the test of time. Because once you buy it, you know, the data's there and there's sustainability. And, and that's a very important aspect um, uh, to choosing the right technology. Clary, I might just add something there. Um, I think the technology discussion is, is a really important one. But uh, as a tip for, as an old field manager, and maybe this is antiquated and showing my age, but I worked out really quickly that I was one of a whole host of representatives that went to for dealers for all sorts of different things. And I, and I learned from someone who I thought was very clever to separate myself from the pack. And even in this technological age, sending, uh, uh, if you're visiting a dealership, bringing um, biscuits or cake, uh, having something to share with the dealership, effectively separates you from the pack of, of people. And if you have to rely on technology to make that connection, that human connection, you can share your personality and your generosity by giving the dealership something, by sending them something that separates you from the pack. So I don't think it just has to be a technology approach. I'd like to think personality and generosity of spirit and recognising personally, whether it's a card or, or just something for a meeting. I'm going to have a meeting with you next week. I've sent some lovely little chocolates for the meeting so that, you know, we can all stay focused together is, a, is a, uh, an interesting way to cut across the transaction of technology. Yeah, a a a absolutely. And, and to go by Ralph's question, um, you know, um, personality is the most important mm. part. You either you either get on with somebody or you don't, and it can be very easy to do business. It can be very hard. Um, but the soft skills training you've mentioned, recommended storytelling. We've just completed a project where storytelling was the centerpiece of the new customer experience for a client. So very much so, storytelling. It's about history. It's about the passion. It's about feeling the brand. Uh, in all aspects from sales to after sales all the way through um, so very much so the change in mindset is not about process it's more about uh, the passion the emphasis on the brand itself uh, and then back to back to uh, Tim's question um, in relation to data collection absolutely right there's data from all parts of the business mm -hmm. um, and again back to technology there are technologies now that link data from CRM to data from learning to data from DMS to data from EVHC, there are technologies there that that now can bring that together and create the business intelligence. But once again, it's complex, and when when it's when an OEM is faced with it, they don't know where to start. Um, but the end result is it's happening and it's changing, and you'll see more and more of it. So you can start embracing it. 
Laurie, if I could just go back to the this question of of, of what we've termed soft skill training, yep. I think one of, one of the areas to check if you're running a field team and, and yeah, and you're wanting to make sure that they've got at least basic effectiveness. One thing thing to check is the level of upskilling that's gone on around you know, negotiation skills, understanding uh, you know, the personality type that you're dealing with. Um, those basic skill, you know, that that when people undergo, when people have some frameworks to work with in a practical sense, your know, lights go on for them. So the, the, you know, they know. Oh, when this person is saying to me quite aggressively, they want this. It's not necessarily that I have to be, you know, anxious about that. It's th that there's a couple of reasons they might be acting like that. So um, that's a good place to check as well. Ha have we given people the basic, some of the basic skills and 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 insights and frameworks that they can, yeah, you know, they can neg that they know when they're in a negotiation and they know uh, they know how to navigate their way through that negotiation. They know how to handle a yeah you know, an, an an objection from a manager and a dealer who who who's you know, got a problem with 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 the program that you're trying to implement so that's a good place to start as well those really basic skills that that help a, a new young person in the in the workforce uh to be effective and look I, i'm looking at time everybody and and ralph your question there is um yes that we do have experience with this uh with all kinds of technologies out there once again it's about studying the need and it's very important that you don't just find a, something that may may suit the bill. You really need to study what your objectives are and identify what is the best tool for it. Um, just just quickly, um, you know, some of the tips and takeaways, Scott, um, uh, I know we've worked closely on this uh, in relation to the tips and takeaways. Do you have any anything to say on this? Yeah, sure. So, so we, we started this out. Um, you know, we, we we saw a potential need for maybe a really radical transformation of the field force with the, the changes the industry is going through. Um, but as I as I spoke to uh, your know, various people, I didn't detect a real appetite to tear everything up and start again. So then we said, okay, if we're not going to tear everything up and start again, what are some of the areas that you can look at to you just to, to make sure you're really being effective and set yourself and obje objectives to improve? And so. Um, we, we, we wrote a blog post on this, which is on, on our website, um, and we've talked about some of this today. Um, this prioritization, this first one about an approval gateway for assigning tasks goes back to Stephen's point about you've got to have a really, really clear focused set of objectives for, for a field, field person on a monthly basis or whatever your, your planning horizon is. They can't do it. They can't have 100 priorities, um, and this is an area I still see many OEMs struggle. Um, second one is about empowerment. Again, that that Stephen spoke to. Your people will be more valuable to their uh, to their dealers when they can solve problems. Okay, and solving problems means you've got to give them authority. And and going along with that, number four is how you manage reaction to, to errors. You train people, you give them authority. They will act. They will make mistakes. So. Making mistakes has got to be at a point where you learn uh, and improve. You can't have really punitive reactions or, or dramatic reactions to mistakes uh, that because then that just gives them the message. Oh, I shouldn't um, exercise authority. I shouldn't try harder. I shouldn't be empowered. So managing managing the reaction to the area errors that will inevitably occur as people to grow is really important. And number five, we've actually spoken a lot about tools uh, that are available today. So that's just a quick wrap up, Laurie. Thanks. And look, everybody, we're a little bit over time. I'd just like to thank very much for everybody attending today. I'd also like to thank the the, the panel speaks, Kunjib, Stephen, and Scott. Um, I think there was a lot a lot of value in it, a lot of crown covered. You can always contact Scott or myself for more information if anyone wants to ask further questions. We are certainly here to support. Uh, and um, we'll have a, a feedback survey come out to you. And we'd really love some feedback on everybody on what other topics you'd like to hear from us. And we'd certainly put that together. And if you want to become on panels, uh, we'd certainly invite you along. So on that, we'd like to thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you again. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies 
Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.